the guy I'm talking with today, I thought about when we first met. I think that right after he and I met each other, I immediately could tell that I had gotten better as a musician by being around him. I'd been playing drums and percussion in college, and I really wasn't so concerned about music theory in my playing. And I met Eric, and the way that it just seemed to improve after meeting him and playing music with him, he's a very inspiring person to be around. So all of that said, I'd like to welcome my buddy, Mr. Eric Tippins. Hey, buddy, how are you? I'm good, man. Good to be with you. You and I met each other and played some music together right out of the gate. I mean, I think we played within probably a few hours of meeting each other. And, Absolutely, uh, yeah. And, and it was like, it was just, it, it was so inspiring to hear you play, and it's been that way ever since. Oh, I agree, man. You were, you were so fun to play with and jam with a lot, too. Just like everyone that I speak with, let's start back at the beginning. Uh, like me, you were born and grew up in Alpharetta, Georgia. Is that right? Yes, Alpharetta, North Fulton County. I was South Forsyth County, Mm -hmm. you were North Fulton County, but yeah, we were kind of growing up in the same area. Where were all the schools you went to? Well, I started out at Northwestern Elementary there in Crabapple Community, and then went to Haynes Bridge Middle School, um, and then ended up graduating from Milton High School when it was in downtown Alpharetta. Both, there's a new middle school, Northwestern Middle, and um, Milton High School, and those have both relocated to the Crabapple area. Uh, about two miles from where I grew up. So um, there's still, those areas are really still growing a lot. I That new Milton High School campus looks like driving through a university. It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me a lot. And I've been in the Performing Arts Center and it's, it's amazing to see the investment that the county has made um, in, in the arts and as well as, you know, athletics as well. It was good to see a good performing arts center with some nice theater seats and good sound system. Yeah, that's great. Well, we'll talk about your, I guess we'll call it your side music stuff in a little bit. But I I was curious, did you do any music stuff at school or was it all away from school? No, I um, I started at that time. I, I grew up in the early, started school in the early 80s and, and mid 80s and 90s. Um And they started band and chorus. You could start in fourth grade. You could make a choice. And so I had been begging my mom from a young age to play uh, piano and to be able to study piano lessons, you know, with with a local teacher. And so we got to the fourth grade mark, and um, I really wanted to play trumpet. That was kind of my first, just I love brass. I love big band stuff. I love the rhythms and the sound and Grew up in a home where my older brother played piano, and so there was kind of always that that pull of piano, but I wanted to do trumpet as well. So mom said, okay, you know, basically, being a single mother, she's like, I can afford one option or the other. So would you like to do piano lessons, or would you like to do band? And I said, well, if I have a choice, I guess I will do piano, because we have a piano at home. And I knew, being a single mom, that that would be a little bit less of a financial Burden. Plus, my older brother had played piano, so I piano was probably my favorite instrument from a child. And so, with that, I talked to the band director and said, "Hey, I'm going to do piano because they were trying to recruit me to to play in the band." And he said, "Well, you know, if you're going to do piano, you might think about chorus because a lot of choral things through the years are accompanied by piano, so that would give you some good, you know, options too." And so, I talked to um, Mr. Martin, who was our um, elementary school teacher, music teacher. And he said, sure. And so I ended up starting, uh, and I sang alto before my voice changed and sang alto for a couple years and just really continued all the way through middle school, did middle school choir, went into Milton High School, which Milton was known for a strong band program. They had a strong choral program, too. Um, We had a director that had studied at Florida State University and a great music school, and he had sung with um, Robert Shaw Corral. Uh, oh, wow. Stephanie. So anybody in the choral world knows Robert Shaw and he sang with him in the eighties and into the nineties. And so we had just excellent access to choral instruction. So, um, we had five or I think five or six choirs that you could choose, which you audition for some of them. There were some entry level ones if you wanted to start. And thankfully I was able to, um, get into one of the higher choirs as a freshman. And so, But because there were so many other choirs, there was a need for accompanist or pianist to play for different groups. 
So I started singing with my choir and then I would play for another choir or two and really just fell in love with choral music, playing for groups, uh, working with a conductor. And so that's, that's kind of how my music journey started through school. Wow. What an opportunity to get to learn under the baton of someone that educated and schooled mm-hmm. and to have that kind of performing experience that, that he had. That's incredible. And, and I'm imagining that working in church music, you probably still apply just a ton of those things that you learned mm-hmm. back when you were in high school right. that you still probably put into action every time you're, uh, you're in front of your group. Yes, absolutely. With, with choral warmups, uh, recruiting, you know, checking in on members too, because, you know, as musicians, we're, we're like everybody else. We have lives outside of music or any kind of creative outlets that we have. And so just finding opportunities to connect with people and encourage people and go through, you know, some rough seasons with them, you know, in life. I mean, with, with job changes or, you know, wayward children or, you know, death of a parent or grandparent, you know, just being able to walk and do life with people, enjoying life. And so it really helps. Um, and I, and I did learn a lot. And I, I mentioned Mr. Martin for uh, elementary school. When I was in middle school, I had two choral directors there. And I think both of them are probably passed on now, but Mrs. Hollinsworth and Mrs. Ryland, both of those ladies could play the keys off a piano. <laughs> and so I really learned a lot of the the Andrew Lloyd Webber, a lot of those, you know, musicals, I got, you know, exposed to a lot of that music and any stuff that was older than us, like, you know, from the sixties, you know, sound of music, all of those type, you know, musicals, Mary Poppins, all of those things. So I was just inspired and encouraged to keep practicing and playing and, you know, singing too. And I'm glad that I did both because a lot of times folks kind of zone in on one instrument, um, you know, whether it be voice or, you know, a particular instrument. I know like you do bass, but I know that you kind of started out, I think, as a more percussion or drums. I started out on drums and percussion and then picked up bass on the side, but starting out as a singer. So yeah, it's beneficial to get as much in your toolbox as possible, you know, to pick up some different perspectives. Because I think what you what you learn on one discipline, it's going to transfer, at least some of it is going to the other things that you're doing. I remember, speaking of singing, you being a singer, I remember even years before I ever met you, you being on Star Search. And I remember I was watching when my mom, and she said, no, this young man, you know, he's about your age and he's singing and we've got to watch this. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to pull for him. And and I just remember that before I ever knew who you were. And, uh, yeah. It's funny. I was just talking with someone uh, the other day about that, that experience. I mean, it's been, gosh, it's been, it's been a long time since that happened. It's hard to believe. I mean, how old Third, were you when you were on there? I was 12. When, wow. I was 12 when it was filmed and I was 13 when it aired. Okay. So, and, and I'm 171 now. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, uh, yeah, it's been 30 plus years, you know, since that happened, but I still remember it. I still remember those things like it was yesterday. And, awesome. um, and what a singer and musician you are. That was really, I mean, you could, you could belt. And I know you got a lot of that from your mom and your dad. I mean, y'all, had musical roots on both sides. and Yeah, I was very lucky uh, that I grew up around a musical family on both sides. And I say this a lot, but it, it was one of those things that I don't want to say I took it for granted because I didn't take it for granted, but I just assumed that that's what everyone's family did. Mm-hmm. And, they, and a lot of families don't. Every time we got together, there was going to be some music. Some guitars were going to come out or... If we were at my grandmother's house, everyone was around the piano singing. I mean, that's just that's just what we did. And uh, you know my family on both sides, and mm-hmm. you know certainly you know Dad's brother uh, Don, and just a just a wealth of great talent in my family. I feel very fortunate to be around all of them that can play and sing like they do. And Uncle Don, I I think of him as a he's one of those encouraging people. When you're around him, if you're having a crappy day or a rough day when you're around Don for about five minutes, your, your mood, your mental health situation is going to turn for the better. And I remember hearing him saying with you and your mom and just being mesmerized at, you know, the talent and just the, the love that flowed from all of you. I think that, you know, as we're recording this, my dad passed away a little over a month ago and, you know, it's you, you have, 
time to think about and reflect on things and think about people that are important to you. And Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever took enough mental and emotional inventory of the influence that Donald had on me Mm -hmm. growing up and what uh, a mentor he was in every way. Um, But even as we just, if we're talking about music, I mean, what a singer he's always been. And I just, I just have so much love and respect for him. And I know you do as well. Oh, yeah, I know he, and, and I will tell you, you mean a lot to our family, both on my dad's side of the family and both in my mom's side. Everyone just thinks the world of you. It is definitely mutual. And his wife, Annette, is precious too. Yes, she certainly is. <laughs> she certainly is. She's a cut up. She can hang with him too. Cause uh, with, <laughs> with his bubble, bubbly personality and optimism, um, you know, there, there comes kind of a jovial joking side and Annette, she hangs right there with him and keeps him in line. She certainly does. (laughs) It's really, really funny. Yeah. They're, they're, they're fantastic. They're just awesome people. said that you started taking piano lessons did you have the same piano teacher all along or did you did you start with someone and then I did I actually um and it wasn't really planned this way but the first teacher I had was uh, Miss Linda Autry and Mm -hmm. she was a well-known pianist in the Alpharetta Canton community her dad was a pastor Reverend Hiram Mulkey um and she actually taught my older brother there was just a connection, and she has a daughter. Her oldest daughter is two months older than me, and we attended church together growing up. So her and my mother were pregnant at the same time. So I remember from a young kid, even really before I knew where Middle C or anything really about music, that when she sat down at the piano or the organ, um, there was just amazing sounds coming forth. And I studied with her probably about a year and so I had attended a music camp after that year, and Miss Linda had went through some personal things with family, and uh, and so I found another teacher in the area that I had studied with, and I studied with Tracy Phillips for maybe two, two to three years, kind of in my middle school years, um, and she left to go on the road with the Perrys. They were based out of Dawsonville, Georgia at the time, and so... I kind of hung out for about a year. Nobody really had any openings, and I was able to get in with Rebecca Fagan from South Forsyth area. She yeah. lived up just in. I knew some some folks that took piano lessons yeah, with her as well. Yeah, She was really good. She really, even though she was primarily known as a church player, she exposed me to classical music and, and the need for scales, technique, uh, kind of like you, you know, taking stuff for granted. Um, I just, I love church music. That was kind of the bread and butter. That's where I used my gift. That's where I figured I would use it mostly um, growing up. And she exposed me to just a whole different world of music and classical and, and knowing the importance of studying the classics and technique and the hand and book of exercises, just, you know, keeping your hands in shape, um, you know, good posture, because that hell, as we get older, you know, being able to sit at the piano and without your back and shoulders and arms and hands and everything else hurting really was good. And she, I think she's the one that really got me ready to play for church. Tracy had got me to a great place, you know, got through all the method books, really drilled theory into me, understanding the why behind it. I'm like you. When I was younger, I didn't really appreciate theory as much. Once I got to high school and started studying with Miss Rebecca, um, I understood very quickly when I got into the classics that theory is important. And if you don't understand theory, you're going to be like a lost ball in high weeds. You're not going to get very far, especially yeah. if you ever play with other musicians or, you know, get around folks that have studied because um, everybody has various, you know, influences and um, things. But having that theory background um, and understanding the importance of why, you're doing what you're doing and why it works. If something sounds good, why does it sound good? You know, there's kind of a right. method to it and things that you can do to add on and enhance that. So when you were learning the theory behind all the stuff you were playing, were you doing 
any theory homework in tandem or was it always applied at the same time with what you were playing? It's a great question. Both, actually. We, we were doing theory. I had went through the majority of my method, I think, if not all of them, method books. And I think I went through the Bastion series, which was a piano series, uh, very popular in the, the 80s and into the 90s. Rebecca and Eloise, which Eloise I studied with when I went to college. Eloise was Tracy's mother and also had taught my first piano teacher, um, Linda Autry, that I mentioned earlier. She had taught her years ago, so it was kind of a full circle thing. And I was blessed with, I always say, a quartet of great piano instructors because all four of those ladies were very instrumental in showing me the importance of theory, technique, um, and passion of practicing and discipline of practicing. And I learned something special from each one of them. When I play and I recall certain things or certain songs or certain styles, there's hand positions or quirky phrases that they would say to me during a lesson that I recall. But I would say toward the end of my time with Miss Rebecca and starting with Miss Eloise, there was a music theory books and it's actually still in print. So that says something, but it's the master theory books. I worked through those books as well. Oh, yeah. Gosh. Um. I actually, I bought them for <laughs> Skylar as well. I'm sure he'll, uh, he'll send the bill for the therapy someday yes. for having to go through yes. those books. Those can get intense. The first two or three, you know, you can kind of sail through if you've been in music for a while, but you start getting into book four or five and six. It's, it's a lot of work. You get into the part writing, the college level stuff. All the SATB writing and the voice leading and understanding, not breaking the rules of music theory. Yeah, it's. I took piano lessons from a couple of teachers. I was terrible at it. I mean, I took class piano in college, but I took some piano lessons very little when I was a kid. And my second teacher, I studied with him for a while. He gave me the master theory books and said, you need to work through these. And... You know, I certainly went through it kicking and screaming, but then at some point you're like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So this is the key that unlocks all the doors that I'm going to have to go through the rest of my life as a musician. Knowing this is going to help. Now you asked me about my music journey when it started, and I know you said you started earlier with singing. Tell me about your experience when you started, if you did only outside or if you did it in school or both. Or So I started singing when I was really young. And when I was a kid, I started doing shows around Georgia and some in the Southeast, six years old, seven years old, and actually had a band that went and played. Um, my dad played piano. Bill Cunningham, who you mm -hmm. know, played steel guitar. Right, steel player. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Terry Swanson, who's a great, great guy, um, played drums. And two brothers, Jim and David Tanner, played guitar and bass. All of that to say, we played, we got to do some really cool shows throughout the years, opening up for some good country artists, Statler Brothers, John Anderson, Marty Robbins, you name it. We got some do some good stuff. All of that to say, that sparked my interest in playing drums. Mm. So when I was in elementary school, I started playing percussion in the, in the band, fifth and sixth grade. And then when I got to middle school, which was seventh grade, I really got interested in it. So my school experience is really, I would say, where my interest really took off. Mm -hmm. But the spark was lit years before that, being around musicians and just seeing what goes into it. I think I always enjoyed that part of it where people get there and set up all their stuff. And I, I, I just, I've always really enjoyed that kind of part right. of, you know, that part of it. So, um, yeah. So like you, I took percussion lessons starting in eighth grade. Okay. I, I didn't take private lessons on um, percussion until I was in the eighth grade. And then I took it all through high school. But um, yeah. I, and wow, it for, paid off <laughs> with, your, so, with your drum and percussion experience as well as your bass. Because, mm -hmm. you know, bass and drums are hand in hand. And that's... So what's interesting for me as a bass player is that, and, and you've, you met him, my mom's mom's brother, my great uncle, his name was J.B. Roper, mm -hmm. and um, he and his wife, Jeanette, went to, was it Northside in yep. Roswell? Northside Baptist Church in Roswell. Northside Baptist yes. Church, which is where Eloise, did Eloise played at Eloise that church? Eloise and Tracy both and played there, so played two of my teachers, yeah. J.B. is the reason why I play the bass guitar in that 
I always looked up to him musically and just as a as a man, as a as a yeah. as an influence. And um, anytime we had a music get together, he was the bass player. I still think that maybe he has the best ear of anyone that I've ever been around. I think he probably had perfect pitch and he was always pushing us to be the best we could be musically. And um, he was quite the singer too. quite the singer quite the guitar player so i would go and stay i was an only child so i would go stay i'd go spend the night at their house and they had this really nice big living room and it had an organ in it and a piano and all of his guitars and his bass and he and i would just sit and listen to every kind of music under the sun and i would grab his bass and kind of play along and he would tell me how to do some things and wow. i wouldn't trade anything in the world for that very informal music education that Absolutely. i was getting from him but it know? was somebody that was already doing it and showed you in a very practical way you know, this is how it's done and and encur- in, a, in an encouraging nurturing environment that's it that's exactly it yeah so you know just it's and it se- sounds like to me and i feel the same way about myself You were lucky to have people on your path. There was obviously a thread that went through all of it, but every person had their own unique thing that you've managed to pick up along the way that's kind of made you the musician that you are now. Absolutely. That's really awesome. I remember having a jam session or two in your basement uh, with JB and Jeanette and your mom and Mm -hmm. uh, before he passed away. I only got to know him probably a year or two maybe before he passed. I got yeah. to know him kind of in his senior years, but precious people. And your aunt Jeanette, she played organ. She'd play B3. I think she was the assistant. So I think she would play when maybe Eloise was needing to cover piano or something. And she was a good singer too. And just, yeah, just learning the flexibility of like, I don't own the piano bench or I don't own the organ bench. If I need to sing in the choir, if I need to sing a special up front or sing backup or lead something, I was just amazed that they were good at many different things musically and could do them all well and just were collaborative. A lot of musicians are you know, very territorial, very, you know, this is my spot. This is my instrument. And it, it seems like from the time that I got to be around them and, and even watch what they do and seeing them serve faithfully in their church, how they weren't selfish at all, that they just used their gift and were just encouraging. And, you know, I didn't have the experience of hanging out in their living room and listening to him play bass guitar uh, and I forgot that he played basic guitar, actually. I mean, that was probably 20, 25 years ago, probably. But just remembering the, the, the influence and the, the kindness that they showed you know, to us younger musicians coming behind them. That's really it. I thought about that. I, and I, and I, don't, I don't play out really many capacities like I used to. But I, I also feel like I was very lucky. And I don't know if this is still as much of a thing as it was back then that I was very lucky to be around musicians that are older than me, Mm -hmm. that they could have been territorial and they could have looked down their nose at this youngster (laughs) that, that was going to play and sing with them. But instead they mentored me, they showed me the ropes. And again, it was just a music education that you can't pay for Mm -hmm. being around people like that. And I, I feel very lucky that, I was able to learn from people that just knew how to do it and wanted to just pass that knowledge on mm-hmm. in their own way. You know, yeah. I feel very lucky. Well, I think it's neat that we're still, I don't know. Do you remember when JB passed away? Was the early 2000s? Late he, passed away, he passed away in 99, I believe. Okay. So we're talking, we're coming up on 25 years. Yeah. And I think one part of his legacy is that 25 years later, we're still speaking fondly of him yeah of his influence and his kindness and i mean you think about most people you meet 20 30 years ago how many do you even remember their first name or what they said to you and so i think we're both very lucky that we were able to grow up in a time and a place that allowed us to be where we are now yes absolutely You you and i met each other through our pal, the crazy Mr. Kevin Albertson. Yes. <laughs> crazy drummer, but good. Crazy, <laughs> yeah. crazy but good very, very yeah. good guy. Great drummer. How yes. did you meet Kevin? We actually grew up, we were two years apart uh, in school. And I think when he was in, when we were in elementary school, his family moved from South Forsyth down to North Fulton. 
and we ended up in the, in the same church, Providence Baptist Church, which is in the Milton city of Milton now. It was between Crabapple and the Birmingham communities. But um, we went to church together, and we actually played in our first band together. Um, there was a group of sisters in our church at Providence. They were the Huggins sisters, and there was there was more than the three that we ended up forming a group with, but um, they had, they came from a singing family, kind of on both sides as well. And so Kevin and I were asked to play uh, piano and drums respectively for them. And so we started out playing drums and (laughs) those early days, we, everybody played wide open. We just kind of did your (laughs) thing and just, if it blended fine, if it didn't fine. Um, but thankfully we were, we were surrounded by people along the way that had kind of come alongside us. And we had some people that were good rhythm section. I know you mentioned your rhythm section with your dad and Mm -hmm. Bill Cunningham and some of those other pioneers that really paved the way for you in the back and, you know, rhythm section with you. Um, and we had some people kind of come alongside and say, Hey, let's, let's learn to share. And, you know, when the guitar player, let's let him do a verse and okay, piano player, you do a verse and bass player you need to lock in with that kick drum and the pattern on the drums and so we just really started learning and we played together for three years and uh, really a lot of fun of course kevin and i were in high school together my senior year i played in the pit uh in marching band because i did chorus from fourth grade through 12th but um my senior year we had somebody leave the band mid-season and so because of my piano experience i was able to jump in on marimba and learn the show and kevin was playing on the snare line. What and year just, would, what year was that? What year did been, you graduate? My senior year was, uh, 94 to five. How long did you play in that group with Kevin? We were in that group for about three years I, or I was with the group three years. I think he might have left maybe six months before I did. That was my freshman year of college. So life was changing for me. I had gotten my first church job, uh, in Roswell playing at Willie O Baptist Kevin left to go play with Liberty, which was another group uh, in the Forsyth County area. Mm-hmm. And and I was playing and singing with them when you and I met. Actually, yep. And I got to sit in with y'all a couple times on That's right. a couple things, and we got to jam, and that was a fun rhythm section. Yeah, it was, you, Kevin, it was a lot of fun. That was a lot yeah, it was fun. a lot of fun. When we met, you had a recording studio at your the house you grew up in, yeah. right? Which in was my mom's basement. Yeah. My mom's basement. And we got together and recorded some stuff. And I just remember you playing and I just was immediately drawn to how locked in your playing was, first of all, and then how it was just harmonically sound and that it, it was so, and I, and I could probably say this, you probably can deal with the same struggle as a, as a piano player, but the, the bass player, piano player relationship can be difficult at times when you're not stepping on each other. Right. 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 You know, and you made it very, and I've always made it easy to be a bass player when, when you're playing, because you, you understand what your role is and you understand what your role is not. And, and it's, it's just always been really, it will, from the day one, it was so easy to play with you in that respect. Well, I felt the same way with you as well. Um, and Kevin, uh, you know, say rhythm section. And I had been introduced in the mid nineties to click track and metronomes. And of course taking piano lessons, you know, I had practiced some classical stuff with metronomes and, you know, like every kid it's swinging back and forth and tick tock, tick tock. And it just, you know, kind of drives you crazy. It's kind of a necessary evil, but, um, I can honestly say when I started playing with you and Kevin, and I think that would have probably been late 98, early 99. I'm not sure exactly when we had, I didn't journal. I should have, because I wish I'd remembered exactly, but it was was toward my senior year of college at Kennesaw state um, that I met you. And I remember we turned on the click track and there really wasn't, and I appreciate your kind comments about playing harmonically and out of your way, but with you guys locked in together and y'all had been playing in a band together there wasn't much choice to not lock in because if you didn't, you were going to be stuck out by yourself. Um, you guys really just locked in and synced up and it just made it fun. And honestly, to that point, y'all are probably the first, I guess our three piece was probably the first time that I had really locked in and kind of, I'd studied pocket 
I had heard Pocket, but I think just playing it with you guys and experiencing it and like kind of riding that and feeling like what that sounds like and feels like in the studio setting was just amazing. And it really kind of, I, I can play progr- progressions and, and licks and things, but I got to be able to stay in the groove and just mm-hmm. learning that the pocket, you know, changes and can shift based on the style that you're doing. And, and, so, it, and it could even shift multiple times within the same song, right? right. I mean, it could, right. it could sit back a little bit in this section and sit on the front end of the beat on right. the next section. It just kind of really depends. And, and, and having like-minded people that kind of understand that and, right. and really lock in and listen to each other. Yeah. It's, and it's the click great. track, you know, in those days, you know, now there's a lot of extra perk and programming and things that go on to music now that has changed and evolved. But in that day and time, normally in the studio, the finished product, you never heard the click. It was just mm-hmm. there for a reference to keep everything locked in. And when you removed that click, it was amazing that the groove and the pocket that we, the three of us shared together. And that was fun. As I remember those times fondly in my mom's basement. And that's when I, you, you helped me reach a different plateau and like another hill. Like, okay, I got to really work on my groove and get my pocket better, you know, as a musician myself, mm. but obviously being able to listen and stay locked in with you guys. Because my first band, we were live. We Everything was live. We didn't have inner monitoring. We didn't have a way to isolate a click. So it was listening to each other and just enjoying making music. Kevin and I started out, we were both, you know, at a, in a gospel group and that's, you know, we didn't do any really secular things at that time. And so just getting to play some different styles and bring some different, you know, country standards, rock and roll standards that we would play for different venues. I know you and I played several weddings and yeah, several gonna, live gigs too. I was going to, I was going to mention that, uh, that I remember us, we played a wedding and I remember us, go, my grandmother had a place in North Carolina and we went away for the weekend and sat and wrote, I can't even remember how many charts we wrote. It was the, an the insane week. number. I think it was 25 to 30, if not more. Yeah, just sitting there, just cranking these charts out, um, and it was just it was so much fun, mm-hmm. just to because and, and again, just like one of those things where I could sense immediately, man, this is making me better. I'm 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 sitting here collaborating with someone who challenges me in a positive way, and I can feel myself improving as this is happening in real time. What I can cool honestly thing. say, my ear. During that charting session, that I don't know, we spent a couple of days there, and I remember, wow, I gotta, I gotta be able to hear these chords quicker and faster because Brad's getting this, you know. It just, I mean, it wasn't a competition, but we were pushing each other to listen better and to write it correctly, you know. And because we were, we were, I think we were playing an outdoor wedding gig for one of my bank customers' daughters in Roswell, and. Mm-hmm. They wanted, you know, a lot of country standards of the day. And, you know, we, we went back and grabbed some of the 80s. I remember one of the songs we wrote, chart four, was You Were the Inspiration, which yeah. as far as circle progression, one of the best songs still to date as far as just you have the intro starts in A flat, the verse goes to B. I think the chorus, you end up in E flat, and then you're back in B. I mean, it's just this circle progression that just – and then the other challenge of of trying how to figure out how in the world to fit all on that on like one or two sheets of paper right. in a legible chord chart that's right. that's not um, like trying to understand calculus. I remember that. I remember us writing that chart. The Nashville number system. I know you yeah. you you taught me some tweaks on that too because you got a little more exposure to that when you your time at Belmont. I did. And I was playing a lot of gigs up there and doing some sessions with people up there, but I took a, you know, and I went through the, the theory and ear training classes at Belmont, but one semester in particular, it was like they pressed pause on our studying Bach and Beethoven. And we got to do a ear training class it was a theory slash ear training class with one of the commercial music professors. And he came in and taught us how to write number charts. And wow. every class was going through it. You know, here's we're going to do a diamond. We're going to do a DS going back to here. And here's the first and second ending and going through that, the notation of it. But then he would sit down at the piano and he would play a 16 bar phrase and we would have to 
like write out the chart and then go up to the board and write it out in front of everyone. And it was like baptism by fire, you know, having mm-hmm. to yeah. having to do that. <laughs> and man, what a what a great lesson that was, you know, to to, to be in a room with like minded people that wanted to uh, that that were all you know we were all learning together. It was Absolutely. amazing. What would you think? I know we mentioned the number system too, and I'm not sure who might hear this. It may just be for us, which that's cool too. But on the number system, what are what are some takeaways or maybe some things that benefits of knowing that system? Because I know a lot of musicians I have encountered through teaching and working with um, sometimes don't see the value or see the investment of time that it takes to learn that. But mm-hmm. what would your thoughts be? Well, I will start answering that question with a story that I heard. Um, my good friends, uh, the Rawson family, who I played music with for many years, their dad, David Rawson, at one point he played a show with Loretta Lynn with a live orchestra. And I guess all of the legit orchestra people were kind of looking down their nose at the hillbilly country players that were being Loretta's backup band for that show. And everyone was already on stage about to play the show. And I guess her tour manager walked out and said, hey, Loretta's kind of feeling kind of bad in her voice tonight. And she'd really like to take everything down a step. So here you have all of these string players frantically trying to transpose everything down a whole step with their pencils on their sheet music. Meanwhile, all of these hillbilly country players are just carrying on their conversation because one is one. It doesn't matter what key it's in. So all of that to say, when you're working with singers, I think it's very beneficial to understand the number system because yeah, there's always the possibility of an audible as far as what the key is going to be. Mm -hmm. And understanding that one is one, it's going to take you far if you understand that. I do understand why people find it challenging but i also i find lyric sheets with the chords above it challenging because i don't understand what the phrasing supposed to be on that right? right so for me i think it's a lot easier to know that if i see one one four four it's a four bar phrase and you play one for two measures and then you play a four for two measures to me that makes way more sense so i do i think that if you have an understanding of the theory around it and understand the scale degrees of whatever key you're playing in, then knowing that when you go into the number system, I think it's easy. And that's the importance of, I think that's the importance of the master theory is learning that because what you're referring to is like movable dough. I know in the music theory college world, there's basically two schools of thought. You have fixed dough and you have movable dough. But for me, movable dough has always made more sense because as you study the circle of fifths, and that's in, you know the relation of keys to each other, and it just goes around clockwise, you go in a circle of fifths, and you were talking about numbers earlier, and just learning your key signatures, what's, what's sharp or flat in a certain key. And if you go up, or, you know, if you're in, say, E flat, say Loretta's song, you just mentioned Loretta, say her song was in E flat, and she said, hey, I want to go down a step. Well, okay, you go to D flat, which is also a flat key, but you know what? I'm actually, that's going to be a little low, so let's go a half step. Well, that's D. So now you're becoming where you're in a sharp key. So just learning those, you know, you know, F sharp, C sharp, those are, that's the scale and being able to play that and knowing where the one is and you just move. And then you think from home base or do as being, you know, your one. Uh, very, very good. And I, I'm, that's a cool story. And I know the string players and most string players I've met through the years are very type A. So, well, the, mm-hmm. the chart is in E flat. That's right. you know, that's what we're going to play in. And it's like, you know, sometimes you have to do what's mm-hmm. best. Because that night, Loretta was, you know, she was the lead. She was the star. That's and that's, it. you know, your job is to support the singer, the worship leader, whoever, the artist up front. Yeah. Well, and so let's take it a, a, a different direction and say, okay, let's say we're, we're all on stage together and we're a five-piece band and four of us don't know the song, but one person does. We don't have charts, but someone wants to hear the song and they tip the band or you're in a situation where you need to be able to play it. I'm not going to sit here and say B flat major seven, F (laughs) seven, right? Right. But I'm going to say one, four, 
five seven. You know, I'm that's an easy simplified language to use on the fly, right. where everyone on stage can understand what that means. Absolutely. And I've and and I've been in bands where it's like, hey, if one person on stage knows the song, let's go for it. Right. Because we'll we'll communicate with each other and we'll be fine. Right. I've been in church services too, worship services, um, where maybe the pastor, um, you know, you're maybe have a prayer time at the end of service and you're going off script, maybe what you have planned. And so, you know, he says, Hey, he looks at the worship leader, he might turn around to me, you know, me as the piano player and say, Hey, I want you to you know. And you don't really have the option to say no. <laughs> I mean you could. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, if if things are flowing well, and, and I've worked with some worship leaders that'll just, you know, they're like, do you know the song? And they'll kind of step back. I'm like, yes or no. And mm-hmm. I've had many times where people will do the hand signals, you know, behind their back. So it's like yeah. a very discreet, because, you know, in a worship prayer time, you know, you don't really want to hear the one, two, four, five, seven, you know, audibly. So a lot of times, you know, they'll even do hand signals behind. And so I think even being worship leaders or directors up front, knowing the number system and knowing and understanding that language and being able to communicate that language in different ways. And there are times where you can say one, five, four, you know, but there's times where behind your back, you can very discreetly and it just syncs everything. So, man, how did y'all do that? That was wonderful. I, you know, <laughs> right. Because right. I don't see any music. They don't see a chart in front of us. And it's like, it's yeah, like got our secrets. You know? Yeah. So, so if you're, if you know, for the, for the, the tens of people that may be listening to this, uh, <laughs> go and buy the master theory books and yes. find a way. There's some great videos on YouTube that explain the Nashville number system and you can watch it uh, and kind of get an understanding sure. of it. And, and I say as a good, as a good exercise, just put on a put on a three chord song and just mm-hmm. train your ear to maybe be listening to the current chord while your hand is writing the one that you just played, and just kind of keep this assembly line going. So mm-hmm. that you know, my goal as as a chart writer is I like to only listen to it once maybe twice if I have to, as I'm writing the chart and then maybe play the tune down Mm -hmm. before I go and play. There's been a lot of times where I would write a chart and never play the song and then just go and play it and just trust, trust your ear, trust trust your experience. That's it. Mm -hmm. Trust your ear, trust your experience that, you know, and, and and as a bass player, you know, I'm writing, I'm writing the inversions and I'm also writing in the margins. I'm writing what the, maybe what the kick drum pattern is so that I can lock in with what the drummer's doing. Just some notes like that, or write a note of who's, if you're going to be giving notes to everyone, right. Who's playing the fills during this verse or who's playing during this verse, just things like that. They can be, they're there as a guide and to help Mm -hmm. you easily translate that information of the song to everyone. I would so. encourage anybody wanting to learn the Nashville number system, find you a fellow musician. There are lots of men and women out there that are very capable. It might not be a traditional piano teacher. Uh, a lot of piano teachers are familiar with the Nashville number system. Thankfully, all of the ones that I studied with understood the, the number system and used it on occasion. And that was very rare, probably 30, 35 years ago when I started out. But Find you somebody. There, there's a JB, there's an Eloise, there's an Eric, there's a Brad, there's somebody out there in your circle that you know that you can get together and you know, at least get started. I wanted to ask you about Eloise because I, I think in the certainly in the Atlanta area, but even further in the church music world, she's kind of a she's an important figure, I would say. Mm. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. And what's funny is that two piano players that I really look up to, you and then my cousin, Stan Mm -hmm. uh, Whitmire, you both studied with with Eloise. Absolutely, yes. And uh, so tell tell the people, you know, what you know about her, what she did, kind of her history of a as a teacher and as a player. She grew up in Roswell, Georgia, and her her mother. I played at church, so she grew up kind of in the church playing, and she started teaching at a young age. I went through grad school uh, at Lee University in Cleveland, Tennessee, a Church of God-affiliated school. Wonderful musicians, wonderful talent, and and learned an immense amount from all of those and their experience, too. But I never really encountered another teacher, even in public school, uh, in undergrad at Kennesaw State. I never encountered another teacher quite like her. 
she had a way of knowing what you needed to know before you knew it. If that makes sense. I know that mm-hmm. kind of seems um, kind of silly to say, but she was more than a piano teacher to me. She was more like a life coach. I remember in one lesson I had been taken for a little while, and I think it was probably maybe my senior year of high school. And I grew up in a church where we did the convention shape note singing. Pretty much if the, the hymnal wasn't in a shape note, and you can learn the shape notes. That's There's a cool history about that. It's the Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. And each one of those have a certain symbol attached to them. And it was kind of a layman's way of learning to read music. Uh, it started back in the early 1900s. But I had played in a church for that. But for some reason, Eloise sensed that you know my music experience and opportunities might expand past that. And so she we got to a piano lesson. I was my senior year of high school. And the Red Church Hymnal, a lot of people know that it's a Red Church Hymnal. It was published in the early 50s by the Pathway Church of God publishing arm music. And she, and she held up a Baptist hymnal, which was round notes, which was fine. I, I grew up reading round notes and, and shape notes and all of that. And solfege, we would do that in choir um, growing up because that was a big Robert Shaw teaching as well, just learning the importance of solfege because it, it assigns an interval to you singing and it makes you a better singer. And also he did a lot of count singing. But to get back to Eloise, she held up that Baptist hymnal and she said, okay, we're going to work work on some of this. And it was around Christmas time. It was around the fall. And so she pulled out, you know, Joy to the World, Key of D Major. And I kind of, under my breath, and I don't know if I was being a teenager, I guess, but I kind of sighed or kind of huffed under my breath, which I didn't think was audible. (laughs) (laughs) She heard it, uh, and she probably knew I was going to do it before I did. Um, Because, like I said, she was a life coach, and she says, look at me. I'm like, oh, crap. You know, it's in that motherly, (laughs) grandmother voice. I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, I have messed up. I am in trouble. You know, I'm, you know, 17 years old. I'm like, crap. And so I just kind of look over, and she says, look at me. And she held up. The red church hymnal, she held up a red, um, a blue Baptist hymnal. And the red church hymnal was, again, the church I had grown up in, been playing for three or four years in that church. She said, right now, this is your world. But she held up the Baptist hymnal. She said, but I want you to be educated and exposed to this world. She said, because you may not be always in this world over here. You need to understand this world, too. And I think probably that was a dividing point in my piano instruction. I really realized that, you know, I've got to learn this. Number one, because you didn't argue with Eloise. If she told you you were going to play something or you weren't going to play it, you weren't. Uh, Not in the lesson anyway. I mean, you might do it outside, but she would probably even know that as well. But she really drilled in on me. And no kidding, not even six months after those lessons, maybe. um, After my senior year of high school, I graduated and I started college. A church in Roswell, Willie O. Baptist, that I had alluded to a little earlier, called me. And said, hey, we are, we're looking for a pianist. Our pianist has um, played for 40, 50 years and has arthritis and, and still play, but we're looking for somebody to come in and you know play that would love some experience and it, you know, it'll pay a little bit. And I was like, well, you know, I'm in college, I've got a car payment, sure, you know, and something I get to do anyway. I would have done it for free, honestly, but um, started playing. And sure enough, when I went to interview with the music committee, they said, now we use the Red Church hymnal, but we also use the Baptist hymnal. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm like, is she a prophet? Like, how did she know that? <laughs> Prophetess? Prophetess, excuse me. And so I went back into piano lesson uh, with her that following week. And she said, well, how'd your interview go? And I said, oh, it went, it went well. I told her about it. And she says, well, I know. She said, I knew that. And she said, because they called me about three or four months ago asking if I had any students that was exposed or experienced in playing Red Book and Baptist Hymnal. And I said, well, I just happened to have a young gentleman that just graduated from high school that's in college that probably would be interested. And so it's like she knew what I was going to be playing before I even knew it. And to to have that gift um, and that discernment, I, I've never met another teacher like it. Like she said, it's like, it's like she knew, and she knew three months probably before, because had I pushed back or not, or not really worked or applied myself in those lessons, I probably wouldn't have got that job because if I only knew the Red Book, you know, because they wanted, you know, in that area, you needed to be able to play both. Wow. And, you know, look, we both know that that lesson transcends music and transcends piano. And that that you could say that about every aspect of your life, that it's so easy to get stuck in this area and not think about 
looking at the bigger picture. And that's that's the lesson she taught you that day. <laughs> and it was setting you up for success. And, and it may have it may have felt a little bit uncomfortable at the time. Yeah. It may have been a little bit of a rub at the time. But a good one. I mean, but a good, a good way one. and a good push in the right direction. And, you know, we lost her two and a half years ago. She passed away, and it was like losing another, you know, mom or grandmother. I mean, because she had walked through me with me through a lot of stuff, through – through college, undergrad, through grad school, because I I went to undergrad, was in banking, and I thought, you know, finance, this is going to be kind of my wheelhouse, and I was called into full-time ministry, and with that, I realized very quickly that, hey, I need some more experience, and so I was able to go to Lee and get into that program and study music, which I'd always really wanted to do as an undergraduate, but I never, I didn't really see the need, because I didn't want to be like a public school music teacher, and I really didn't see the need for it, and Eloise helped write a recommendation for me to get in and sit down with me and said, here's the questions they're probably going to ask you. And here's, here's how you need to answer them. And no kidding. When I got into the interview and they were asking questions, like I think there was probably five or six questions they asked. I think three or four of those five or six questions she had said, this is probably what they're going to ask. And she wasn't on staff there. She really didn't have any connection to the school, but they knew who she was because of her legacy and other students. And you mentioned Stan Whitmire, um, your cousin, he plays at Mount Perrin in Atlanta and has for 40 since plus I was, years. Yeah, since I was yeah. a kid. Yeah. I think he started playing there when he was like 15 years old, which, I mean, he's like you, child prodigy, phenomenal, had a great family of singers and influences around him that pushed him and, and made him practice and, and encouraged him to practice and to study. And Mount Perrin Atlanta is a church of God. And so mm-hmm. they knew her name because one of her students, Stan Whitmire, played at Mount Perrin. So, you know, just, just seeing that full circle that, you know, they didn't know her personally, but they knew of her because they knew how devoted and how phenomenal and capable Stan was as a musician. And so them knowing her name and to know that we studied with the same thing kind of got me into the conversation and got me into the program. Of course, I had to work my tail off. You know, I had to learn, you know, they don't give music degrees away. You have to really earn it and work hard. What was the degree that you were doing at Lee? Church music. I had a, it was a master's in church music and it was an emphasis in choral conducting. Okay. Um, which was great. You know, working in front of choirs, you would sing, you would direct your peers. They had some uh, instrumental ensembles at Lee that they would book time and, you know, with their directors and let us stand in front of them and, you know, direct a, a 16 bar score of, you know, handle or, you know, something, you know, Tchaikovsky, whatever, you know, to help us um, get that experience of, and then learning to rehearse a group. You know, we would write a 16 bar uh, orchestration of something, a hymn or something that we like of our liking. And we would take that, you know, we would print it off for them, give it to them, and we would give them a few moments to listen. They would give us feedback on, you know, some articulation, maybe some expression, some things that you could do to make your charts better. Mm-hmm. Um, and so just having that experience, but just really, you know, practical getting room ready to work in church. I think, did you work with Larry Goss at some point? I up did there? get to, yes. He was teaching orchestration. Um, and he's another one like Eloise. Honestly, he had a high school diploma. He graduated from, I think, the high school in Cartersville, Georgia. I think that's where he was originally from, him and his two brothers, James, Ronnie. Larry was teaching orchestration in a grad program. He was that good. And he learned it from sitting in ASO rehearsals. He had a friend that was in the the ASO, and he knew some friends that were in Robert Shaw, and so he would just sit in the back of the hall and just listen to the string players and the orchestra play, and he would just listen and Basically, like you would do with numbers, he would just kind of write down different lines and things he would hear, and then he would take that back to the studio, and he would hire you know, a violinist or something, maybe from the ASO, and say, hey, we well, played this line, and, and they would give him some feedback. So he just kind of learned it, you know, basically on the street, you know, just having to learn it. Wow. If you play in a church orchestra anywhere in the United States, at least, maybe even mm-hmm. beyond, mm-hmm. it would almost be impossible not to play a Larry Goss chart. Oh, absolutely. They're that good. They're that I, timeless. I played at Mount Pisgah United Methodist Church in, mm-hmm. in uh, Alpharetta and played in the orchestra, and we played Larry Goss charts all the time. And and our friend uh, Scott Meter 
talked yes. a lot about working with Larry over the years. And I think he played drums on some of those choral mm-hmm. recordings that they may have done. And Larry was just, he was special. He was. And as humble and down to earth uh, as they come, but could sit behind a piano and just, I mean, the chords and the voicings that would just flow out of him. And he pushed me to be a better piano player because not only do we get to study choral conduct, well, we got to study orchestration. We got to study uh, choral arranging. We all got to study piano accompanying, which meant we got to shadow him uh, on several sessions over a couple semesters. We got to shadow him in Nashville. We actually got to sit beside him with headphones, watching him and other Nashville legends, you know, Craig Nelson, uh, Scott Meter, uh, or John Hammond, you know, different guys, um, Kelly Back. Kelly Back, yeah. Um, and just just being in the room with one of those guys would be cool, but like being around four of them to see how they just had a respect and love for each other. And, and you know, and this was rhythm section stuff. They would always start with rhythm section first, then they would bring vocals in later, and then they would bring the orchestra in, which they'd always start with strings in the morning because string players are type A generally, and they like to get up early and get about the day. Mm-hmm. The brass players, they're the more fun, laid back. They're going to come in in the evening. Um, they've worked all day or they've done their thing and they come in and they're laughing and bouncing off the walls and just seeing how a project come together from start to finish. And we would see his meeting notes with a, with a particular artist or a group, whether it was a quartet or trio or solo artist, and he would write a rhythm chart number system. Then he would, you know, write the vocal charts, do the orchestration to see all of it come through and just to hear the final product. But honestly, I was always amazed. I love his orchestration. I love his string line. Still probably as better as any, as good as any arrangement ranger that I know his string lines. He just had a way of making strings pop off the page. Um, and I think he just loved nylons and cellos and violas, but just the rhythm tracks, you're talking about basic piano, bass, drums, and guitar. I mean, those tracks alone would, were just solid. And I'm like, man, that doesn't need anything. And you know, he would, then they and would he, add all those extra things. And he was writing all those rhythmic hits and everything at oh, the same time. Absolutely. You know, the wow. articulations and wow. You know, the carrots and the pushes and hey, this is a right hand push, which means, you know, the right hand part of the band, you know, above mm-hmm. middle C, you know, the piano mm-hmm. player, my right hand is gonna push it, but you as the bass player, my left hand, uh it, assuming I'm staying out of your way, you know, I'm not gonna push it. And so just learning the differences there and learning retardandos. Um and seeing drummers go through, you know, we were talking about click tracks earlier where they go through and they have a click track that, you know, doesn't move. But seeing them punch a click and having a drummer go in and like click that retardando so that when the orchestra and the brass players come in, they can hear how much of a slowdown because, you know, Larry was playing at the time. You know, and you fought the drummer, everybody, if he was the session leader, you followed him. If he, he'd do a scale and it was always dead on time. And then when they would start back, at the a tempo section, it was amazing how the four of them would just lock in. And we're just like, how do y'all do that? And he's, like, that just, he's like, we've just been playing together for years. We just right. know it. We've, and they're like, we love Larry. We feel it. We know kind of where he's going. And very rarely in Nashville did they ever have to punch. I mean, I mean, it was usually like an overdub or something when they would usually mm-hmm. punch. But usually the first, whereas most church bands or jazz bands, you know, if you're playing, you know, the second, third, fourth playthrough is going to be a little tighter. For some reason in Nashville, like their first one is usually the best because it's like everybody brings their A game to start. And like you start punching and start finagling or playing with the tempo. The song actually usually suffers for it over time. I think so too. I think everyone be- tends to play a little more defensively than there's a little bit of a reckless abandonment when you on that first take that you just kind of go for it a little bit mm-hmm. more and you're not as worried about making a mistake. And right. then you get hypersensitive for the fact that you don't want to make a mistake. So yeah, I I could see how it would lose some of that spark the more you do it. But man, what a, and I I was lucky to get to be a fly on the wall in some sessions, having a friend, Bruce Boughton, when I was living up there. What an education also that we got from older musicians oh, that trust us, trusted us to come and sit in these sessions, what we learned just by watching how this whole right. thing unfolded. It's right. incredible. And we learned to be quiet. I mean, we were flying the wall. Like you didn't distract because like, you know, it's hundreds of dollars every minute, you know, and so right. you, you didn't, you know, you asked questions between takes, but you stayed quiet and you soaked it up. But just seeing the level of professionalism, but the sincerity and, and just the, I guess like you and I have like, you know, we're both, 
only children now. I had an older brother that passed away, but, you know, we're more like brothers. Um, and there's just that bond there. And that's what they had with those guys because they played on albums together for years. Yeah. And upbeat stuff, jazz stuff, you know, gospel stuff, contemporary stuff, everything. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter what style it was. They were going to bring their A game. know i get to share one of my best memories as a musician with you because you were there as well in that you had a group you had a trio and you guys were recording an album and i at the time was playing in a corporate band and was playing with a great drummer in atlanta named scott meter phenomenal drummer phenomenal drummer great guy you wanted me and scott to be the rhythm section on on the project you guys were doing and I'd played with Scott on a million live gigs, but I had never played a session with him before until that day. And I don't even know if I can put into words what that experience was like for me watching someone of that caliber be so in control of what they were doing as him while completely being the most caring and just laid back guy mm. in the world. That was I will carry that memory with me for the rest of my right. life. He really took us under his wing because he had a lot more experience in playing with, you know, high end players, you know, mm-hmm. than, and I was honestly with him being in the room, I was starstruck. I honestly, when I asked you to ask him if he would play for the session, I honestly didn't know that he would do it because I thought, you know, this guy's, who are these guys? But he did. And he didn't come in and treat us or look down on us any, any different. And I remember we had 10, we had 10 songs tracked that day. And usually, a 10 song day, if you can get that knocked out, you know, piano, bass, drums, uh, if you can get those knocked out solid in eight to 10 hours, that's a good pace. Mm-hmm. And I remember to date, as far as the number of songs we cut, we cut, I think we started at like 9 30 or 10, and by 2 30, 2 45, we were done. Yeah. And Scott said, Will y'all book me for eight hours? Like, I feel like we need some more charts. I'm like, Man, that's it. But, he made us play better. I mean, there wasn't really a choice, but you know, we wanted to, but it was almost like he was so humble, but like his playing and just, he was so musical on drums. We had some really good times that day. And that was probably one of my favorite sessions today because we played it quick, but it was right. And as we listened back and we started adding B3 and drums and or, or and, um, guitar and B3 and orchestration later, I listened about those tracks. I'm like, man, how did we do that so fast? It was incredible. It was it was so fast, but it never felt rushed. Mm-mm. I mean, I remember walking him out to his car, and he's like, oh, I feel bad because we – I said, Scott, don't feel bad. You just gave everybody, like, the gift of time of right. all these hours that right. – right. you know, that it was fantastic. Yeah, he's um, – I consider – and I know you're the same way. I, I just okay. feel so lucky to have gotten opportunities to play with people that have elevated – my thinking and playing sure. to another level. And Scott is certainly, certainly one of those people. Well, and he's humble. I mean, he reminds me a lot of Larry. Like he's just that humble, you know, you think of a musician of that caliber, you think, well, they're probably going to be arrogant or kind of hard to, but it's quite the opposite. I mean, they're so laid back, so chill. And it's like their chillness and their easygoingness, you know, just makes us feel more relaxed and better. And I think that's a gift. I mean, I think that's, you know, like Eloise had a gift for teaching. I mean, I think Scott had a gift for taking younger musicians, maybe with less experience. I mean, we had, we had chops and we could play, but he made us play better, but he did it in such a way of, it wasn't like the way he looked at us. It was like, he treated us like peers yeah, and equals that day. He didn't look down on us or, well, I hope y'all can stay with me. I mean, and I played with some players like that, you know, they're just, they come in and they've got their, you know, their attitude on their shoulder and who all they played mm-hmm. with. And it's like, you know, you're just tense, but we felt very relaxed and I enjoyed every moment of it. And I, and I hated for, you know, what, four or four and a half hour session. I, I hated know. it for it to be over because it was so good. And I do wish I'd have had four or five more charts, but I had never recorded tracks that fast. No, it was, it was, it was unbelievable. And yeah, I was the same way. I was a little bit disappointed because I was really kind of 
excited that we were all going to get to play with each other for like eight hours that day, mm-hmm. and then we didn't. <laughs> yes. Oh, I know. I was like, well. Well, okay. All right. But still probably some of the best tracks that have ever come out of yeah. the studio. I mean, honestly. And, that, yeah. and that's no slight toward anybody else. It's just like a moment. It was like a day that I won't ever forget. I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, another highlight for me was um, getting to work with you on your Christmas album, the solo oh, Christmas man. album. Oh, you that played. was so fun. Well, and you helped with those, and you helped me push. I know one of the songs on that album we did was one of my favorite, speaking of Christmas traditions, I love to watch Charlie Brown Christmas. And, of course, Vince Guaraldi did a lot of the music for, if not all of the music for those cartoons for Charles Schultz. And we did The Christmas Time is Here, which is one of my favorite. It starts on the major seven. It's Mm -hmm. just so pretty. The melody just kind of plays itself. And, you know, we were doing rhythm section stuff, and I think that particular song probably had the least amount of ins- instrumentation on the on the whole album from any other track that we did. It was literally drums, bass, and piano. It was three piece. We, we did kind of the Vince Guaraldi trio kind of feel. I don't even think we added guitar or anything later. And I still listen to it. And I'm like, man, I'm like that was so fun. And it was in a lot of space, right? There was a mm-hmm. there was a lot of air in the track yeah it was really good and then some of the you know the more dense things we did on there um and remember we did a an arrangement of we three kings that was mm. really cool a lot going on kind of a, a latin type thing yes. and george sandler, sandler played drums on that sounded great and then, another phenomenal drummer oh, good man. great guy oh, local man. to our area blessed yeah. to have him here close and then um did Mark Mundy play guitar on that? Mark Mundy did play guitar. Yeah. Did a great, that's actually, you had introduced me to Mark, and uh, he was available. The guitar player that I'd used for many years was not available for that particular time frame that we needed. And you said, hey, man, give Mark a call. He would do it and came over and just, wow, so fun. And you talk about somebody that has an ear. Like oh, he, he reminds man. me a lot of your uncle JB. That mm-hmm. He just, I mean, he could read charts and he was good, but he just had a very natural way of knowing what the song needed. And he was coming in kind of after the fact, you know, because bass and drums, piano were there. And to see him come in and just find those nuances and add some really fun stuff. And I remember he wanted to take We Three Kings. He take, he we, we did some tracks in the studio and he just, he wasn't quite, and they were, they were going great. They sounded great, but he just said, man, I want to take this home and kind of spend some time. I've got a different nylon or something home I want to try. I think it would really fit the Spanish kind of vibe you get going. And I remember him sending me back, you know, the wave file of just the guitar and we layered it in. It was like, wow. I mean, it was just, it just sparkled, you know, and yeah. just, I was like, man, it's not, I would have, I kind of missed because he did that at his studio, you know, which, the, you know, that's technology and overdubs. And sometimes we have to do that. But I really regret not being in the room when he cut those tracks because it was, it was so musical and so fun. Yeah, he's he's a he's a fantastic musician. Yes, a great player. But to call him a great guitar player really sells him short of what he really is. And he's he's just a great all around musician. He plays. <laughs> yes. He's like you, man. He plays like he plays like a producer and an arranger. He's you're playing your part, thinking about how it's going to enhance the total product, and sometimes. Maybe that means I'm going to play this. Sometimes maybe it means I'm not going to play anything. Right. Whatever my part is to make the sum the best it can be is is what you guys do, man. It's uh, it's just inspiring to to well, be you, around you it. You push us there too, and you covering those bass notes. I'll be honest with you, because you know, growing up and playing a lot in church, I don't know that I've ever had a bass player that I trusted more to play the chart. I know when Brad Williams is on the bass, and I know I'm referring to you <laughs> like you're not on here, but just for whoever's listening, when Brad Williams is on the bass, I don't have to worry about the left hand. I can almost leave my left hand in my lap, or I can play some tritone kind of seventh things going on and let you vibe on those you know, inversions, the roots, and, and just setting up that groove with the drummer. And that's just, it's fun when you can turn loose and just literally stay 
and I've seen little memes before on Facebook where, you know, folks will have, you know, an octave or octave and a half blocked off and said, you know, left-hand piano player, we don't need you here. We have a bass player. <laughs> and, and a lot of times in church, like if you're not there, there'll be a lot of wrong notes. But when Brad's on there, the notes are going to be good. They're going to be in time, in the pocket, and they're going to be musical. Like, you know, a lot of times people think a bass is just a very basic instrument. But when you solo your bass tracks, and we were mixing, we were soloing the bass tracks, and, and I still go back and listen to those because I've you know, bounced them kind of down to waves, and I listen, and I'm like, that is so musical. And a lot of bass players, you know, they're just, well, I'm just playing the read, I'm just the group. No, you're, you're putting inflection, articulation, the scale tones, you're making it musical, you're making the bass, you don't play lead guitar on the bass, but you're making it so fun and interesting that, I mean, you could honestly do a bass and drum track and it would be cool, be very musical. So just in your touch and how you play, and if I'm going to do my five string, or if you're going to do, I think you had a four string you played on some stuff, and it just depends on what the song needs. I'm going to blame all of that on just being around people that are way better than I am. You and George and Mark and Scott and man, I tell you, man, I'm just trying to keep up with y'all when I'm on the sessions with you I, guys or getting to play in the studio. It's, it's, uh, it's like, I've got to bring it because, because Brad's going to know if I don't <laughs> and, uh, and George and, you know, Scott and Mark and I mean, I, everybody. I just feel, and I'm sure you feel this way too. I just feel blessed beyond what I deserve to get to do what I've done you know mm -hmm. and Absolutely. and uh what an opportunity it, it's been to just get to hang out and share fellowship with musicians that you think a lot of as musicians oh, but even more as just people and yeah it's it's great so well Eric I'm not going to take any more of your time buddy I uh, I could honestly sit here and have this conversation for the next 2 or 3 hours but um the people might get a little sick of hearing me talk uh not you <laughs> they'd get sick of hearing me no, talk No me too man no <laughs> I've uh, enjoyed it too it's been fun yeah. hanging out especially not living in the same state anymore it I know. Uh, feels like we're we're sitting together just chilling I don't know. Let's uh let's just let's agree that this is part 1 Well Eric I love you buddy Love you too, my brother. So much fun. Thank you for sharing and reminiscing with yeah, me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, we'll do it again soon. Thanks for listening to The Bandwitch Tapes. I'm your host, Brad Williams. The show's theme is called Playcation and was written by Mark Mundy. Drop me a line at the email address, thebandwitchtapes at gmail.com. Make sure to subscribe to receive new episodes of the podcast. And while you're at it, please tell someone else about the show. Thanks for listening.